Over the years, there have been hundreds, maybe even thousands of talented rappers, but there's levels to MC, and only a select few have been able to break through into an elite class of MC, with their rap skills being almost alien-like, something that no other human can match. One of these MCs who has truly mastered the earthly art of MC and brought it to new levels is Pharaoh Much. Pharaoh has been in the game for over 30 years, and he's maintained a reputation of being one of the best technical rappers to ever do it, surviving through several eras of underground hip-hop, while giving us a discography that pushes the boundaries of rap in ways that no other MC has ever done. Pharaoh has had asthma since a young age, which forced him to develop a new style of rapping. He had to mold his breath control into a brand new way to rap, and that's helped him become one of the most respected MCs in the history of hip-hop. Before he passed, the Notorious B.I.G. cited him as one of his favorite rappers. Eminem has cited Pharaoh as one of his biggest inspirations. At one point, The Alchemist even called him the greatest of all time. Cool Mo D, one of the most influential MCs of all time, said Pharaoh Manch is like an eloquent linguistics professor, moonlighting as a rhyme serial killer terrorist, challenging the listener's IQ while daring him or her to keep up. And there's no other way that I could put it. Pharaoh Manch is truly a beast on the mic. Pharaoh was born and raised in Queens, home to some of the most brilliant minds in hip-hop, like Q-Tip and Nas. But before the crop of 90s legends, Queens was home to some of the most important trailblazers of the culture, and Pharaoh grew up in the heart of it, going to hip-hop shows and parties throughout the decade. He went to the High School of Art and Design, a school that Pharaoh described as having a plethora of culture, and was home to future hip-hop legends like Prodigy and Prince Poetic with the latter becoming his partner in rhyme throughout most of the 90s, as one of the most dynamic rap duos of all time, called Organized Confusion. Originally, Prince Poe was the rapper, and Pharaoh was the beatboxer of the group. But after realizing his talent on the mic, they became a rapping duo. In the early days of the group, they went by the name Simply Two Positive MCs, and linked up with Paul C., who was something of a hip-hop folklore legend, working with the ultra-magnetic MCs, Boogie Down Productions, and Rakim, before tragically being murdered at the age of 25. Paul C. became a mentor for the duo, not only teaching and guiding them in creating their first demo, but also being an older brother figure to the duo. Paul was able to get their demo to Russell Simmons of Def Jam through Bobito Garcia, who brought the Simply Too Positive demo as well as Nas's first demo over to Russell, who turned both of them down, saying that Nas was a cool G rap wannabe, and that he wouldn't sign a group with a name as whack as Simply Too Positive. Needless to say, the group changed their name, but Russell was the one who missed out that day. Under the new name Organized Confusion, the duo signed to Walt Disney's Hollywood Basic record label. Paul C. had passed away before they started making their self-titled debut, so they were without the guidance that helped make their acclaimed demos. Without Paul's assistance, the duo was forced to experiment on their own, sort of winging it until they found their own style. The duo would go on to perfect their abilities later on, but their debut in 1991 is a great showing of their immense potential, both as skilled MCs, but also as two of the brightest artistic minds of their era. The album was entirely produced by the duo, and only had one feature, being OC. The tone of the album ranges from light-hearted tracks like Who Stole the Last Piece of Chicken and Audience Pleaser, to more socially conscious songs like Prisoners of War and Open Your Eyes. The duo's style was a blending of Native Tongue's freeform rhyme style with a bit of a darker and more lyrically dense approach, bouncing off the walls of each track with inventive flows and rhythmic patterns. This album was critically claimed at the time, with Stanton Swihart of All Music calling it the definitive underground record of the 90s. While the group showed incredible potential on this record, I don't think anyone could have predicted the heights they would reach artistically on their 1994 follow-up called Stress, The Extinction Agenda. Both MCs improved tremendously, and are incredible here, but Pharaoh gives, no lie, one of the greatest rapping performances of all time on this project. I'm not sure what he was doing between 1991 and 1994, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was abducted by aliens, because what he's doing on this project is straight up otherworldly. From the very first track, he is determined to forever change the art of MCing, altering his voice to be a different character from his own a technique that can be directly traced to modern-day artists like Nicki Minaj and Kendrick Lamar. By 1994, hip-hop was in full swing, with classic albums being dropped month after month, so organized confusion had to find ways to cut through the pack and bring something that no other artist could do at the time. This album is lyrical excellence from start to finish, with my favorite track being Bring It On, where Pharaoh unravels about 7 or 8 different flows in a matter of 80 seconds. 
and Stray Bullet, which showcases the duo's talent as two of the greatest writers in hip-hop history, writing the song from the point of view of a bullet. And remember, this was before Nas tried the same idea on I Gave You Power, so they were trendsetters in this regard. Their third album, The Equinox, was released under Priority Records in 1997, and while this might not be as iconic as Stress, it's still a highly underrated album in the annals of 90s rap gems. This album is a little more ambitious than their first two, being a concept album and including numerous skits throughout. I don't think the story of the album is quite as effective as they hoped for, but the music itself is still incredible, with the MCs pushing themselves creatively as writers and as artists. One of the most boundary-pushing songs of their careers is In Vitro, where the duo raps from the point of view of two unborn twins, with one hoping the mother gets an abortion and the other hoping to be born and see life. On the song Hate, the two MCs rap from the perspective of white supremacists, and as we've seen from other artists' attempts at the same topic, like Joyner Lucas's track I'm Not Racist, it could be easy for a track with this subject matter to feel more like an after-school special than a truthful portrayal of its heavy themes. But organized confusion pulls no punches, channeling the scathing hatred that makes this song almost hard to listen to. And that's the point. The MCs are calling attention to something that's straight up ugly, and they make sure that when you hear it, you can't escape its reality. This album ended up being the duo's last together, but Pharaoh ended up having another lifespan left in him as a solo artist. The stars aligned as Pharaoh Manch realized that his next phase of artistry would be as a soloist, as his newfound freedom coincided with one of the illest rap renaissances that we've ever seen, joining Raucous Records right as they were about to change the underground rap landscape, joining some of the greatest to ever do it like LP, Mos Def, and Talib Kweli. The album Internal Affairs is one of the best rap albums in the absolutely stacked year of 1999. This album has everything you could want from a Pharaoh Manch project. Fiery lyricism, inventive flows, concept tracks, and just some dope hip-hop. It features some of my favorite Pharaoh Manch tracks of all time, like Behind Closed Doors, Queens, and Hell. But there are some tracks here that cannot be glossed over when talking about Pharaoh's incredible discography. This album has a much harder and darker feel than his earlier work, and that's perhaps most noticeable on the track Rape. Pharaoh takes cues from Common's legendary track I Used to Love Her, rapping about hip-hop as if it were a woman. Except Pharaoh's approach to hip-hop is much harder and more aggressive than Common, so he expresses his relationship with music as a tale of rape. The track is hard to listen to due to its subject matter, but Pharaoh handles it in a way that's so impressive with its lyricism that it's almost impossible to turn away from. The Light is perhaps my personal favorite track on the album, as it's Pharaoh's version of a love song. Just listen to the first few lines. The way that he opens this track and describes first seeing this girl is unlike anything that any other rapper could do in just two lines. He says, It was like the earth twisted around her, she shifted the ground, I was like, oh, shit, she's off the hook. Just like that, he puts us in his mind state, and we can see the distorted world that he sees at that moment. But you can't talk about this album without dealing with the most infamous song of Pharaoh's career, Simon Says. This track was a behemoth, a banger which was cutting through the underground into the mainstream, while still maintaining Pharaoh's attitude and alien touch. At the time, the song was featured in movie and video game soundtracks, and 23 years later, it still gets played all the time at sporting events around the country. Unfortunately, the song which could have catapulted Pharaoh's career into another level of the culture ended up being one of the biggest headaches of his life, halting his career and becoming a cautionary tale for every artist who came after him. Pharaoh, who produced the track himself, sampled the Godzilla theme music and gave all the sample information to the front office at Raucous so they can get everything cleared. But as I discussed in my Raucous video, the label heads let Greed get the best of them and tried to sneak by without clearing the sample. What would have been a $12,000 lawsuit ended up costing a half a million dollars, which left Internal Affairs being in a sort of limbo for many years, not being able to be distributed, and Raucous on a downward spiral. Now looking back, Pharaoh has an optimistic outlook on the situation. Knowing that it all worked out, and that he ended up having at least two more decades as an underground veteran, but one can't help but wonder the heights Pharaoh could have reached if he continued his trajectory into the 2000s. It wasn't until eight years later that we got another Pharaoh Monch project. He released Desire in June of 2007, and reminded hip hop heads everywhere that he's one of the best rappers in the universe. After he left Raucous, there was a bidding war from labels like Shady Records, Runya Nav Records, Bad Boy Records, and Sony Records, but he ended up going with Steve Rifkin's SRC Street Records Corporation. This album is much more soulful than its predecessor, 
with Soul sampled production, and Farrell even singing some of the hooks himself. After working with The Alchemist on the internal affairs track No Mercy, the two reunited with the title track Undesire. I'm pretty sure this was the first Farrell Monch song that I ever heard back in high school, and it immediately got me hooked on his style. On When the Gun Draws, Farrell reignites his famous formula perfected on Straight Bullet, personifying a bullet once again but this time with 10 more years of rap experience to get the point across. The album is rounded out with great tracks like Push, What It Is, Hold On, and So Good, making for one of the most underrated albums of the mid-2000s. In 2011, Farrell returned with the album War, which stands for We Are Renegades. The album continues his run of slept on solo joints, with the album's military themes giving him the guidance to fully explore the theme of each track with his lyricism. He links up with some of the most talented rappers of the underground, like Immortal Technique, Royce to 5 9 Fonte, Styles P, and Jean Grey, making this a playground for lyrical mastery and experimentation. The album features many dope tracks like Black Hand Side and Let My People Go, but the most notable is the closer called Still Standing. Farrow has been asthmatic since he was very young, and this track details his struggles with this roadblock in his life and how he was able to persevere through it. And with a beautiful Jill Scott hook, this is one of the most powerful songs of his career. As great as War is, I feel like it was just a trial run for his next full length LP called PTSD, which has a similar feel to War, but has more refined concepts and lyricism. Where Pharaoh describes the War album as him going to battle as an independent artist, PTSD is him coming to terms with the effects of those battles, and who he is now because of it. The album follows up on the personal trials of Still Standing, but delves deeper into his mind state, making for the most personal album of his career. Times Squared tells the story of a man who has post-traumatic stress disorder and gets fired from a job due to some dangerous behavior. And then on Losing My Mind, Pharaoh deals with his own personal thoughts of depression. Damage is a cool song because it concludes his Bullet trilogy, continuing his trend of writing songs from the point of view of a bullet. And this is my personal favorite of the three. It's also awesome hearing Pharaoh continue to test his skills against other top MCs. On Rapid Eye Movement with Black Thought, you can hear the two MCs pushing each other, bringing out each other's best and most creative lyricism. And then on Dream, Pharaoh and Talib Kweli unite to flip Wu-Tang's classic Cream in a brand new way. But my favorite track on the album is called Bad MF. This track has Pharaoh just showing off. No grand concept, just him spinning his shit and having fun on the mic, proving that he's one of the best. M -m 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 Mashing in that Aston Martin on the Verrazano Narrows. Greatest of all time in the latest apparel. 80s baby ladies dreaming on some Mercedes shit. Go tell your favorite rapper, eat a bag of baby dicks. Farrell made us wait seven long years after PTSD to get another project from him, but it was worth the wait. He returned as the frontman of a band called 13, consisting of him, renowned guitarist Marcus Machado, and Jack White's drummer Daru Jones. 13 has been a number that's been showing up throughout not only Farrow's whole career, but also his whole life, being diagnosed with asthma at 13 months old and being born on October 31st. He viewed the number 13 as a sort of omen, both a blessing and a curse that he would live his life by. The album is called A Magnificent Day for an Exorcism, and it's truly one of a kind. It's just as much as a rock album as it is hip-hop, which makes sense as pharaoh has been a huge fan of rock since he was a kid. The bars are a mix between the eccentric, otherworldly experimentation of stress and the more matured, controlled approach of PTSD. This is an album that I'll be honest, I didn't fully give the credit it deserved when it came out because the rock-inspired production is so far out of my wheelhouse. But in researching for this video, I re-listened to it a few times, and I really was missing out. This truly stands up there with some of his best work. Farrow has been known to take his time between projects, only ever giving us between one and four per decade. So unfortunately, we probably won't be getting a new Farrow Monge project anytime soon. But his career has been so dynamic to this point that I don't really care. He's given us enough heat to last centuries at this point. And his music is the type that gets better over the years because it's so ahead of its time. If you've never heard the Organized Confusion album Stress, then I challenge you go listen to that project right now and tell me that's not some of the most dynamic rapping that you've ever heard, even to this day. Farrow Monge is one of the greatest humans to ever rap. That is, if he's even human at all. Now I'm not really sure if I believe that aliens have visited the Earth before, but if they did, the only proof of that that I need to hear is Farrow Monge. Thank you for watching everybody. I've been a huge fan of Farrow Monge for years, so I had a lot of fun making this video. If you guys enjoyed it and want to leave a like and subscribe to the channel, that is greatly appreciated. 
I come out with underground hip hop related videos around every one to two weeks, so I got a lot more headed your way. Let me know if there's any other artists you want to see me cover in a video like this. Thanks for watching.